before we introduce you then to Dr. Sam Hills, who is a, a director at Linton, uh, runs all the clinical and after sales service side of the business, um, but she's also a university lecturer, uh, an honorary lecturer at University of Manchester. Um, what's the department? It's not the physics department, it's the... It's the musculoskeletal and dermatological sciences department. Absolutely. A bit of a mouthful. Uh, no, and uh, Sam, Sam essentially lectures on some of the MSc courses for medical students, teaching uh, them about lasers and, and their applications in mainly skin technologies. Um, and so I guess we could get going, Sam, if you want, with the slides. And, mm -hmm, yeah. um, this is a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour, starting with a bit of background on light and lasers, how light and lasers functions in tissue, and then on to some of the overall technologies that are used in aesthetics particularly. Yeah, well, I just thought that lots of us know a lot. Let me just see if I can share this here. Lots of us know a lot about the particular systems that we have in our clinics, but it may be that you have questions about, you know, other technology, perhaps what your competitors are using, or, you know, what's the difference between you know, an Alexandrite and a Q-switch laser for tattoo removal or hair removal or, or whatever. So, so basically the idea is to give you an overview about that. First of all then, we'll start off with um, just a bit about light. So I think you'll all know that light is just what, the light that we can see, visible light, is just a really tiny proportion of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So at really tiny wavelengths, we've got gamma rays, we've got x-rays, then we've got UV, and then between UV and infrared, we've got visible light. So, so what we can see. After that, we've got infrareds, we've got radio waves, we've got microwaves. So all of those things, you might be familiar with RF technology for things like rejuvenation and microwaves, body shaping, um, but, but pretty much all of the lasers that we use in aesthetics are either visible light or infrared, near infrared really. So we'll, we'll sort of go through all of those. So, right, question for you then. Good what question. is a laser? So, I think most of you will be aware that it's an acronym. Go on, John, tell us what it is. Oh, you're really testing me out. Is it light? <laughs> I'll go with light. Well, can I, before, you, before you say anything, can I say, I did a talk for my daughter's year five class, and there was a lad in her class that knew not only that laser was an acronym, but he knew what it was. Not my daughter, I should point out, <laughs> but a 10 year old. So go on, mm. light. Go on, I'll go with amplification. Oh, by stimulated emission of radiation. Of course. Get yes. that right. Wow, that's <laughs> And you notice it's not, it's not zimulated, right? So no Zs for your laser. It's, uh, it's stimulated emission of radiation. Um, so, just going back to your, your point about someone in the class at school knowing the answer to this laser thing. Kerry's asking, was that my son? No, unfortunately, he doesn't go to that school. My son doesn't have a clue. You'll have to ask them later. Yeah, Kerry's also mentioning that shouldn't it be uh, oscillation instead of amplification? Mm. Yeah, well, the light is bouncing in between the two mirrors, isn't it? But yeah, loser, not quite as catchy. No, so. it's not as good as laser, is it? <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, um, we're not going to go into what lasers are. If anyone wants to know more about that, then Core of Knowledge is a, is a good course for that. Yeah. But some properties of laser light that you'll be familiar with is that is the main one really is it's monochromatic. So <clears throat> mono, single, chromatic colour. So a, a laser will give out one wavelength of light. I mean, you can tune them to different wavelengths, but on the whole, a laser will give out one wavelength of light. Those light waves are in step with each other, so all the peaks and the troughs match up. And as we know, lasers are directional, so they travel in a straight line. They don't tend to, to spread out too much. They don't diverge. So they're the, the main properties of laser light. They, 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 they travel in such a straight line. It, they've done experiments, haven't they, measuring the distance to the moon? So they can literally shine a laser to the moon, reflect it back, on, and it comes back to Earth. And, and so it's all, that, all these... All these conspiracy theorists who think that we didn't land on the moon, yeah. I'd like to know how we got the little mirrors up there That's so that right. we can do that, those studies. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, so they're properties of laser light and there are loads of different lasers that we use in medicine and surgery and aesthetics. So, you know, they're, they're just some of the examples of them now. So we're, we're gonna sort of talk through a lot of those um, in turn a little bit later on. But of course, before we do that, a lot of us will be familiar with um, IPLs, intense pulse light sources, and they, they are different to lasers in that um, they are basically flash lamp driven. So we have these flash lamps filled with, filled with a gas, then on gas generally. Um, and all we do is we basically pass an electric current through the lamp and then you get this very intense, bright um, light that's emitted in all different directions. So we've got a mirror behind our flash lamp to redirect it into the skin. But the light's emitted in all directions, unlike a laser, and lots of different wavelengths are emitted as well. So all of those different wavelengths, basically, when you mix up all the different colours of the rainbow, then you get white light. Yeah. So light bulbs, the sun, IPLs, all of those emit light. So this is really one of the main differences between IPL and laser. They're not Lasers give out one wavelength of light, IPLs give out a whole range of wavelengths of light. Now we can use filters to, to you know, tweak which wavelengths we want to let through and which we want to get rid of. Um, and that's one of the reasons why IPLs can be really, really versatile, flexible systems, really. It, it's, um, it's monochromatic, isn't it, laser light? But, sorry, co it's coherent, but, but you, it's, not, it's not coherent, is it, when it's white light technology like IPL? Yeah, exactly. So, so that, that coherence, those peaks and those troughs of the waves all, all um, matching up, that doesn't really make any difference in terms of when we're doing the treatment. You know, if we're doing hair removal, for example, we don't really care about the light being coherent. Um, and, mm -hmm. and when it hits the skin anyway, I mean, John, you know more about this because your whole PhD was on light tissue yeah. interactions, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. that's the point, isn't it? With one of the properties of laser light is coherency. And um, actually when a laser penetrates tissue, most, most of the wavelengths are scattered very quickly anyway. So you lose a your... very good scatterer of yeah, light. It is. So. But there are some longer wavelengths that aren't too bad. And there's, a, there's OCT, optical coherence tomography, that can use coherence. But on the whole, most lasers we'd use in treatments will scatter so quickly that it becomes non coherent very, very fast. So the, the property of coherence in, it, in lasers in tissue is sort of redundant, really. It doesn't matter, basically, which is why IPL a non-coherent light source that's fine the big thing is wavelength and all these things it's mm. about choosing the right wavelength really yeah so wavelengths yeah most ipls when you see them when you see them flash they're not it's not really white light it kind of looks pinky or yellowy and that's because we tend to throw away a lot of those shorter wavelengths those blues and the greens that are just really heavily scattered don't penetrate very deeply and then just cause unnecessary heating in the topmost layers of the skin so types of pulses we need to discuss before we talk about the different types of lasers. So IPLs and lasers that we use for hair removal, for vessels, for most skin rejuvenation, um, we call those long pulse lasers. And that's because the pulse duration is of the order of about milliseconds. So clearly that's still a very short time frame. But when we compare that to Q-switch lasers, so Q-switch lasers um, give out pulses that are much, much quicker. So they're nanosecond pulses. So go on, John, how much quicker is a nanosecond than a millisecond? Very quick. A nan <laughs> nanosecond is a thousandth of a millionth of a second. It's so short. If you could get your head around that, that's amazing. Incredibly short pulses, aren't they? So, um, yeah. And what does the Q stand for in Q switch? Quality, quality switching. So I like, I like to explain Q switching. I think we're going to come on to it in a bit more, but it's a bit like... Um, it, in laser physics, there's a, you have a cavity, which is basically two mirrors and lights bouncing up and down between two mirrors. And the, there's a property of that cavity called the quality of it. And the Q switch is put in there to disrupt that quality. Uh, but, but really the effect it has is it sort of allows all the photons to build up inside the cavity, and just get released when you want them. But uh, yeah, I'll mention that again when we come on to the Q switch slide, I think. One, one of the delegates in one of my courses once said, shouldn't it stand for quick? 
I was like, yeah, <laughs> I love yeah, that. Very good, quick that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quality switching. So, just to overcap then what the difference between a long pulse and a Q-switch is, is that long pulse lasers and IPLs, you know, give out long pulses, millisecond pulses. They can create a, a heating effect, a thermal effect in the skin. So it's these types of systems that are used for hair removal, for the treatment of vessels. Um, but if you want to treat tattoos or pigmented lesions, for example, you don't want to cause heat in those. And those of you that do hair removal will know that you cannot treat over a tattoo. If you do, you'll get some really, really nasty burns and nasty blisters. Um, you need these Q-switch lasers and they cause a, a different, completely different effect in the skin to a, a heating effect. It's something called the photomechanical effect. So we need those Q-switch lasers for, for tattoo removal. Not all uh, Q-switch lasers are the same, though. You've probably seen, I mean, for one, the one obvious difference is the price. You can, you know, spend anywhere from, I don't know, 10, 20,000 pounds up to 100,000 pounds for a Q-switch yeah. laser. Um, and the ones at the, at the lower end of the market um, tend to be smaller. They're not, you know, there's some very good systems out there as well, but they, they, they tend to be these uh, passive Q-switch lasers. And the different is, difference is instead of one incredibly short Q-switch pulse, they string together lots of pulses. So they are, they can be very good for fading. So they're very popular in the um, sort of tattoo studio market because, you know, what they want to do a lot of the time is fade down the tattoos and then, you know, pop another one over the top. But for, I guess for the, for the you know, for the gold standard of removal, you're looking at an active Q-switch really. Yeah, I mean, it's like, the, like, the Q-switches are like, um, if it, if it like a river flowing, a normal laser would be like, light coming out of the river just flowing down the valley and then if you built a big dam the q switch laser or the q switch would be the dam stopping the light flowing out of the laser and then allowing it all to build up behind the dam and like a passive q switch would be like where it would just lap over the top of the dam every so often mm -hmm. it fill up drop over fill up drop over and so you get these short pulses really short but very low in energy each pulse and usually you string a sequence together, don't you, just to get enough energy out of the laser. Mm. But an active cue switch, like when it, when it build up and having some gates, and when you were ready and you had enough energy or enough water trapped behind the dam, you could open the gates when you wanted and you choose when that happens yourself. Electronically, you control the cue switch mm. in just That's at the really right nice time. That's a analogy, yeah. You open up the gates and all of that water can flood out. Still a very short pulse, but much, much higher energy, all in one go. So active Q-switch is far more effective, that, in my view, in many of the applications we use. Mm. So it doesn't mean passive is, passive is good, but the active, you've got much more control and you can do more with it, I think. Mm. We, we use passive, though, in a, some of the laser cleaning for statues, don't we? So it's the same technology as tattoo removal, essentially. I mean, in, in the early days when we were doing conservation work, people were, were lugging these massive lasers, yeah. weren't they? Literally floor standing lasers up on scaffold to clean buildings. Yeah. So the, the smaller passive units are just perfect for that. Yeah. So we, we make both, we make both Q-switches, types of Q-switch, mm -hmm. which is fine. And they both have a great role to play, really. Mm. So yeah, just recapping then on, on what we mentioned earlier about these long pulse lasers creating the heating effect. So if we can get our tissue to 55, 60 degrees, we can denature the proteins. And if it's hair removal, for example, um, then if we get those stem cells that are responsible for regrowth up to about that temperature, then hopefully we can permanently destroy them or at least, you know, for long term. Um, slightly different though with tattoo remover, what we're doing, those incredibly short Q-switch pulses are causing such rapid heating to, you know, such high temperatures, but the ha it's happening so quickly, the heat doesn't get a chance to sort of dissipate into the surrounding area. And instead you get this shock wave being produced. It's a mechanical effect that breaks down the, the tattoo ink, and then the body's white blood cells can come and clear that over probably a few months. So that's the difference between the Q-switch lasers, they cause the photomechanical effect, and the long pulse give you that, that focus. So, Sam, I remember, I remember when I started my PhD uh, asking my supervisor this question. It was that 
you know, you talk a lot about be careful in the sun because you can get skin cancer from, from light, you know, and, uh, and then suddenly we're lasering people with, with uh, light all the time. Why don't we get skin cancer from using lasers? Because the, you get skin cancer from very short wavelengths of light, so UV light. And the shorter the wavelength of light, the higher the energy of the, that individual photon. So, you know, ultraviolet light is more dangerous than visible light. Yeah. And X-rays are more dangerous than that. And then gamma rays <clears throat> are more dangerous than that. It's those, it's those high energy photons that can come and interfere with our DNA and then cause malignant changes down the line. If you sit under a light bulb for 100 years, it's not going to give yeah. you skin cancer. Yeah. Right? So, so the wavelengths of light that we're using for our aesthetic lasers are, are the same. In fact, the next slide might be, oh no, we'll come on to that. But there are, as I, as I mentioned, most of what we, you probably, most of you guys have maybe seen this sort of plot before. But I'm not going to spend ages like you know talking about that. But what it is, it's basically along the this axis here, we've got how much absorption there is, and then we've got color or wavelength of light along the bottom axis. And what you need to take away from this is just that different colors of light will target different things in the skin. So we call them chromophores, something that's going to absorb light, we call it a chromophore. So there's three main ones in the skin: like blood, melanin, and water. So pretty much all of the lasers that we use are going to target one of those chromophores. So clearly, if someone's got some little broken capillaries on their cheeks, what we're trying to target is blood. When you say if target, someone <laughs> for hair removal, what we're trying to target is the melanin within the hair. That's why we can't treat hair without any melanin in it. So white hair, grey hair, blonde hair doesn't respond really well. well. And when you say target sound, the light's absorbed, isn't it, into those mm -hmm. targets? That's when right. It, and then once it. the light's absorbed, that's when we get one of those two effects that we talked about. So we either get a heating effect or we get a photomechanical effect mm -hmm. when we get absorption. So that's what we're after. The idea of selective absorption, the, the key thing, isn't it, that, that um, different wavelengths are absorbed by different things. So like when you're looking at objects and they have a colour like grass is green, isn't it? That's because oh, that's because it's absorbing wavelengths of light other than green so so from the sun you've got the, all the rainbow of colors it all mixed up together so it's, it's white light it's hitting the grass and uh, you know red's being absorbed and blue's being absorbed and orange being absorbed but green light isn't and it's bouncing so it's only back those green it. photons that are coming and hitting your retina at the back of the eye and that's why you're seeing that that is green yeah. So, so we, when you see things of different colour, like t-shirt, grass, whatever, it's because those photons are being bounced back and everything else is being absorbed. So we can use that technique by picking the right wavelength of a particular laser or an IPL to make sure that it doesn't get absorbed by the skin tissue but when it hits like the haemoglobin in the blood vessel or melanin in the hair, then it is absorbed and that's when the reaction happens. Mm -hmm. Which is quite a clever selective absorption mm. technique, I think. Which is exactly what this is. So this is that brings us on then onto the selective photothermolysis. So this theory was put forward in 1981, and yeah. it basically, you know, there are three main things that you need to get right. You need to have the right wavelength, depending on what you want to target. You have to have the right pulse duration, which is dependent on something called the thermal relaxation time, which we'll go into another time. Um, and then you also just have to have enough fluence, enough, you know, enough light for it to, to do its job. So that's selective photothermolysis. So pretty much all of the lasers that we use use this kind of principle. Um, so as we, if we get, look at all the different wavelengths, I'll start off with the lower wavelengths first of all, and then go up to the higher wavelength. So this isn't really one that we tend to use so much in aesthetics. Um, excimer lasers, the, the main use for excimer lasers is in um, corrective eye surgery. Um, but they are also used in dermatology and they're useful for conditions like psoriasis and vitiligo. But of course, this is UV light, so it can potentially cause skin cancer, going back to what you were saying earlier. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it, it's, it's really for treatment of localised. You can use, for example, you can use... Um, sunbed type tubes to do these treatments as well but then 
you're getting large doses all over the body. Whereas if you're using a laser, you can target, you know, different psoriasis plaques, for example, without having to expose the healthy tissue. Uh, so yeah, we, I mean, we don't deal with these particular lasers. I don't, I can't, I don't think there's that many throughout the country, no. to be honest, apart from for, you know, eye surgery. Then. Is it worth mentioning that you're moving through the spectrum as we go through these lasers? Mm. So? Yep, so I'm starting off at UV and then I'm going to go through blue, green, yellow, all, all the way up. But the next one really is um, KTP, or as it should be called, a frequency doubled MD YAG. It's a bit of a mouthful though, so you can see why people stick with KTP. Yeah. And, and this is an MD YAG laser, so those of you with MD YAGs will know that that's at 1064 nanometers and 532 is half of that. So yeah, that's the trick, isn't it? You, you, KTP is just a crystal, isn't it? It's put into the laser and the, the, the ND YAG that we're all used to, 1064, is fired at this crystal and as the light travels through it, it converts it, it, it doubles its frequency, doesn't it? Yeah, and if you, you double the frequency, that halves the wavelength. Correct. Yeah. So that's why 532 is, is well, obviously half of 1064, 1064. I don't know if people know that though. I said that to no. someone, an editor of a magazine, You've been in this industry for years and never realised 1,064, if you're half, it was five. It's half of five through two, yeah. Yeah. Well, pre, well KTPs, they're, um, if they're long pulsed, they're right at the top or not. They're on one of the haemoglobin peaks. So they're very good for superficial vascular lesions. So these shorter wavelengths, shorter wavelengths, because they get scattered more, they don't penetrate as deeply. So um, facial vessels tend to be superficial. So it's, it's good for those. Um, you tend to have quite small spot sizes with these. So, you know, for, for vessels, it's fine. For conditions like rosacea, they're more, it's more difficult to treat because you're limited to a small little round spot size. Um, it's really useful, though, when it's Q-switched for the treatment of red tattoos. Reds, oranges, pinks all those sorts of colours. So we need the KTP laser to be able to treat those pigments. It's the only one really that can do it. Should, should point out, um, and I've learned this to my detriment actually, Sam, that so the green KTP output on the Q-switch laser is incredibly intense. Um, Did you look at it, John? No, luckily, no, <laughs> never, ever. I'm not advocating looking at lasers at all, and especially not a, a green Q-switch laser. But, but it's so intense that um, green is the center of the visible spectrum because our eyes are tuned to green light more than any other light. Mm -hmm. um, I guess because there's loads of green in glass and through evolution, our eyes have, have, have centered on green. But for that reason, when you design um, video cameras, and use a CCD array inside mm -hmm. it, they're also tuned to green light being the center of the spectrum. And they're really sensitive to it. And if you decide you want a video, a tattoo removal treatment using the KTP Q6 laser on a high energy, the uh, light can be, can be so intense that it can fry your camera and damage all the CCD array inside yeah. it, as I found out. I heard, I've heard of that happening years ago, but not recently. Maybe I don't know if the technology is different now, maybe. Yeah, it probably was. Yeah. Where yeah. I discovered that, we were doing a demonstration of one of these live feeds probably going back a few years and when it went black the guy the, the, the camera volume was still working the microphone he said what, what's going on with the picture I said, no, no, I know what I've just done and it was, it was actually the surgeon's camera personal camera oh no so be careful well, they're also used it's, it's also quite commonly used um we do lots of laser safety talks for um surgeons as well in hospitals and they use a laser and they call it the green light laser um, for um, urology work. So for prostate, Safe. enlarged prostate, it's a very common condition in, in older men. And you can ablate the prostate with the, the KTP. So that's kind of where you might come across KTP. Uh, pulse dye laser. So pulse dye lasers, again, uh, target blood. So good for vascular lesions. These really, <clears throat> these are the gold standard for port wine stains would think. If you're in a hospital where you're going to be treating port wine stains, you're probably going to be treated with, with a pulse dye. You can get some amazing results. I mean, this picture here, that's a fantastic result on a darker yeah. skin type. Well, not to get any pigment change and no, fantastic. 
So these lasers are tunable. Um, they used to be at 577, then they were usually at 585, but nowadays most of them are 595. And the reason they've gone longer is because those longer wavelengths give you that little bit more penetration into the skin. The reason though, why we don't see these, we see them, as I say, in hospitals all the time, we don't see them in aesthetic clinics so much, is because you get this purpura. So this is this bruising effect that you get with pulsed eye lasers. And that's because the pulse duration is incredibly short. So it's about half a millisecond and it just ruptures the blood vessels and you get bruising. So if you've got a port wine stain, you might pull up with a bit of that. But if you've popped out, you know, to get a few little nose vessels zapped or some on your cheek, you don't really want to be walking around like that for a week, generally. So you can do it in non pupuric mode, but the results don't tend to be as good. So a question for you. Going back to that slide before, how come you can use them on uh, darker skin? Surely that's a bit higher risk at this wavelength. It is riskier, yeah, <laughs> it is. So those shorter wavelengths are, are always um, riskier to use on dark skin types. So for example, if you're treating red tattoos in, in darker skins, you're much more likely when you're using these short wavelengths to get some pigmentation change. But the, the pulse dye laser is, is relatively safe um, uh, you know, the, the pulse duration is very short and you're using very low fluences on the whole to be effective because it's so so well picked up by blood. And if you see, especially in that lady in the picture before, her port wine stain was so vivid and there was so much target there, so much vascular target. That I think that perhaps that's why, one of the reasons perhaps why she, it was such a good result in terms of the uh, lack of pigment disturbance. And what's causing the uh, bruising effect then, Sam? Just the capillaries bursting open? Yeah, those short pulse durations just cause the vessels to just rupture and then you get bruising, basically. So that's what's that, that, That's an end point they're looking for, isn't it, with PDL? Yeah, yeah. As I say, you can extend the pulse duration, but um, you do tend to get better results when you get the purpura. Yeah. Okay. Next. Next, we've got ruby lasers. So 694 nanometers, the first laser to be ever. Have a laser. Yep. Can I tell a little story? Go on, please do. So Ruby laser, first ever laser produced um, as an experiment in a lab. So in fact, was it two years ago? It's the 50th anniversary of the first ever laser. And that was the Ruby laser. And it was built in a physics lab as an experiment to prove Einstein's theories because Einstein predicted laser before the first laser ever existed. Some of his work suggested that he could create this uh, effect in crystals and, and uh, cause excited electrons and all that sort of stuff. And so some guys that many, many years later thought, we'll, we'll try and prove Einstein correct. And they did, they did. They created a ruby laser. They got it going in the lab and famously said at the end of it, wow, what a fantastic experiment. We developed the first ever laser. Uh, it's great for proving Einstein's theory to be true, but no idea what you'd ever, ever use this thing for. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't see any application for the first laser that had been invented. Uh, and now look at those lasers everywhere. When do you think, I've got a question for you, John, then when do you think the FDA first approved laser hair removal? Ooh, no idea. I don't, if you had asked me that, I'd say 10 years ago. 10 years ago? We were, do, we were doing that yeah. for... <laughs> 10 years ago Done. it was it was 1997 i thought it would be much yeah. before that so apparently they've yeah. been doing it so since about 77 laser hair removal sort of experimentally okay. yeah. but it wasn't until 1997 and if you think that linton's been around since what 1994 25 years yeah yeah so we've been around since before laser hair removal was even fda approved that's true yeah, yeah. Just a quick question popped up. Sorry, I'm jumping back to the slide before. You That's know right. the puric effect. Is it is it permanent? No, no, no. So it's just bruising and it, it lasts five days, four, four, five, six, seven days, something like that. So, so, so it does fade down. So the yeah. point you want to reach, because you know you've damaged the blood vessel, don't you, because it's burst open. It's caused a bruise, but like a bruise, it'll fade. But it's yeah. a, it's, it, it demonstrates, it helps the surgeons on the know that they've achieved what they want to achieve and that's getting rid of the blood vessel really. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, so interrupting. That's all right, no, it's fine. 
Uh, so the ruby laser, first one to be developed full stop, but also the first one to be used for hair. So um, very effective because there's lots of melanin absorption at that wavelength, but it's very aggressive. So it's if you're skin type one or two, you probably can can get away with it. But even then, I can remember someone on one of our courses once, she's skin type two, she'd had treatment about 20 years ago with a ruby laser and she still had hypopigmented marks all over her legs from this. And this was, you know, someone with very fair skin. One of our customers used to use a, a ruby and she said that when she did it, when she used to do full legs, it used to take eight hours to treat. Wow. <laughs> Wow. You'd go mad, wouldn't you? So yeah, so for that reason, it's it's not very you know you can only really treat people with very fair skins. It's very slow, um, so they're, they're not really commonly used yeah. now for hair removal. But they are very useful for treatment of green tattoos and blue tattoos. And green can be you know really tricky to remove, as you as you mentioned earlier, John. We can detect green far easier than we can any other color. So we have to remove more of that green pigment for yeah. it to look good. And also a little bit of red against our skin doesn't show up as much as a yeah. bit of green. So the so greens and blues can be, can be tricky. Um, next we've got Alexandrite lasers. So again, 755 nanometers. We've still got lots of melanin absorption here. So this is a really effective hair removal system. You can treat skin types one to three with no issues. Four, if you're careful. You can treat you know some fair asian skins but for caucasian skins most people consider this to be gold standard and one of the reasons for that is you can get really nice short pulse durations out of Alex, and that that really helps with this um, you can also get them now in pain-free mode which i'll talk about in a little bit so that picture there is the the motor system that we sell for example that's the first pain-free alex that's uh, on the market you can also get q switched alex um, so you can treat black tattoos with a Q-switch, Alex. You can treat black tattoos with any wavelength. There are certain reasons why you choose other way. You know, if you have the choice, you'd probably choose a longer wavelength. Um, but you can also treat green tattoos with, a, with an Alexander as well. So it's a, the other alternative to a ruby Q-switch. And it's really useful for the treatment of pigmented lesions. So café au lait, macules, other types of melanocytic mucus, that kind of thing. Uh, Alex is just verging on the infrared, is it, Sam? Yeah, so I have a story about that. I, when I was doing my PhD, I was using Alexandrite laser and I was there with my supervisor and we had this optical bench and we were looking at the light and um, I said, oh, it's clipping that mirror there. And she said, well, how do you know that? I said, well, because I could see it. I could see the laser beam landing and it wasn't right on the mirror. She said, well, you can't see 755, it's infrared. I said, well, I can see it. <laughs> and she couldn't see it and I could. So, you know, we sort of think that we can all see the same colours, but it's like with hearing, some people can hear higher frequencies, like younger people can hear higher frequencies. And um, the cutoff for visible light is anywhere from 700 to about 770 or, or thereabouts. So some people can see it and some people can't. And do you know if that's still true? Can you, could you still yeah. see Alex? I was wondering if it was because I was younger, much younger <laughs> then, but no, I can, I can still, still see. And I know because... You know, with the ruby laser, for example, if you, can, if you catch kind of flashes of it from the side of your goggles. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, can still see it. Um, what have we got next? We've got diodes next. So diodes mm -hmm. are um, good hair removal lasers. So usually 810 if it's for hair removal, but there are lots of different wavelengths uh, that diodes can be used at. Um, you can treat skin types one to five with no issues. Some, some manufacturers will say that you can treat skin type 6. Again, you'd have to be very careful if you're treating skin type 6 with it. Um, we do a diode laser. It's a pain-free model. So there are lots of pain-free versions of diode lasers about. They've been around for, for a fair few years. Um, you can also treat vessels with diodes. But this is all long pulse. You, don't, you can't cue switch a diode laser. Yeah. Um, I, we, we used to, many years ago, we were uh, um, involved with endovenous laser treatment. So this is where you put... A, a laser fiber inside a varicose vein, for example, and then you heat it from the inside, you withdraw it and you're, you're, you're heating up your vessel from the inside. And one of my favorite stories is, is going and watching one of these treatments being done. It's all done under local anesthetic. Yep. And when they started firing the laser, the patient said, oh, I can, I can taste barbecue. She could taste her, her vessels being cooked. 
which I think is amazing. I know, it's, that's because the, uh, the blood that's getting cooked in your vessels flows around your body and goes through capillaries in your tongue. Oh, and you wow. can taste it. And that, I mean, we went to Germany to watch this, didn't we? I think I nearly fainted at the time. <laughs> I've got a good question here, and I think it raises something that I was going to talk about as well, and that, yeah. that is to do with Alexandrite lasers and diode lasers. And, and um, I've, essentially, there's a, a, I've got a question here saying, I've been looking at Alexandrite lasers, and I saw a company called Alma, and they have an, one called an Alex. But the wavelength um, looked more, or the, the, the handpiece looked more like a diode, although it was a wavelength of 755. Can you explain? Yeah, then, I got this question yesterday in one of our core of knowledge courses, actually. I, I, I think there's a confusion with diode lasers, and, and um, the best way for me to describe it is diodes are, the, the term diode laser is thought of as a specific type of laser, and, and people say you can get an 810 or a 940 or whatever, but diode is a very generic term, isn't it, for laser? It's a bit like saying solid state laser. So we have solid state lasers, that's what we predominantly manufacture and sell, and that's like Ender Yag and Ruby and Alex. They've all got a crystal inside them, and the crystal is what makes the light, the, the laser light. Well, diodes made by essentially like a silicon chip almost, mm -hmm. uh, and different diode lasers can be manufactured to make different wavelengths of light. So saying I've got a diode laser would be a bit like saying I've got a solid state laser. Well, you wouldn't really know what solid state laser you've got unless you said it's a ruby and then you know it's wavelength or if you said i've got a yag and then you know it's wavelength or with a diode you don't really differentiate like that at all unfortunately people just generally call them diodes but, but you can make different diode arrays to give out tons of different wavelengths and this is a good example that is questions thrown up here because there is a product on the market where there's a handpiece and they call it the alexandrite handpiece and I would assume that's an Alexandrite crystal, like for hair removal. But, but, it, but, it, but it could easily be, and it is in fact a diode laser with the same wavelength, 755. Mm. So it's not really an Alexandrite crystal at all. It's just another diode handpiece, isn't it? And um, you, know, you could argue whether that's, that's better or worse. I mean, it's the same wavelength. The problem, and you touched on it just now, Sam, with diode, you can't pulse a diode in the same way you can pulse a solid state laser. So you can get much, much shorter pulses at high energy with crystal, with solid state lasers than you can with diodes. So that we do have, in my opinion at least, better results for things like hair, you know, very short pulse, fine hair, a, a true Alexandrite crystal solid state laser is much better than the same wavelength you might get with a diode handpiece. I th so I think there are differences. Those, yeah, I think those diode lasers are only gonna. I mean, you didn't. You a few years ago, you weren't. Well, even like you know, people with LED lights in your home, they used to be red, didn't they? And now you yeah. can get them in a whole host of colours, and they've come down in cost and things like that. So I think we will over the next few years see you know more of more of those probably, more of those different wavelengths. Sorry, um, Sam, just a, another quick laser, uh, laser uh, question. You know, you know um, we talk about this taste like barbecue when you're doing the legs. Uh, yeah. what, what about um, people who say they can taste uh, like metallic taste in the mouth when you're doing tattoo removal? Yeah. Oh, really? I haven't heard of that. Now, I have heard people say that they, they've had um, like fillings and stuff tingle when they're having uh, facial treatments. But that must be due to the fact that most tattoo pigment are, is, are metallic salts. So iron oxide, titanium oxide, you know, cadmium, there's lo loads of different types, but they're all metal salts. So it must be something to do with that, breaking that pigment down. But that's not something I've heard before. That's interesting. Um, and I guess, yeah. But I guess it's, it's feasible that that could flow around your bloodstream. And as with the burnt hemoglobin, you could taste that in yeah. your mouth, I guess. Yeah. Well, certainly reds, uh, red inks and black inks are often iron oxides, you know, ferric oxide and ferrous oxide. So that, you know, that sort of metallic taste that we think of is, is often iron, isn't it? So mm. it could be, could be that. Another quick question I think is going to lead us into your next point, and that is uh, some diodes are supposed to be quite painful for hair removal. So how can that pain-free be? Yeah, so, so the pain is, is really, well, there are a few that, the pain is due to the heat, okay? So there are a few factors that, that cause that. 
but but the penetration depth is really key so in fact you're right the next one oh no next one after this we're going to talk about nz yag um the nz yags a lot of people consider to be one of the most painful lasers and that's because it, it penetrates quite deeply so the nerve endings are all deeper within the dermis so you can feel it but um but there are these pain-free lasers such as the soprano by alma for example our motor system and there, there are a few others our initia system as well they use the, the standard method of doing hair removal is this sort of stamping method so we all know this we do a shot if we move on to the next area we do another shot we do you know so and you're getting very high intensities which is causing very high peak temperatures so you're getting that snappy kind of out you know whereas with the these high rep rate uh, lasers or pain-free lasers what we're doing is we're using much lower fluences and faster repetition rates and we just rather than doing this stamping method we just go over the area so we tend to mark out an area about so big and then we just gradually heat up the hair follicle so instead of getting that snappy ouch you're just getting a gradual build up and so sometimes you can feel a bit of heat and if you've got darker skin you can feel a little bit more heat but you don't have that same sort of snappy pain that you know when people talk about the elastic band or the fat spitting on them you don't get that sensation with these and i must admit i was i was a little bit skeptical about these lasers but i'm yeah. absolute convert I, I spent inappropriately spent a whole summer telling people to feel my legs <laughs> because i just i treated one leg with the pain-free laser and not and, and didn't treat the other one and i was so impressed just after a couple of treatments and i've i've got quite fair hair so you know i just i just didn't think it would work at all it was absolutely fantastic but we do say that you know on the whole if you want the very best quickest results stick to the standard mission but for me if you're a wimp like me then yeah. you know I'd, I'd rather have a couple more treatments and, and go with the pain-free option so so, so the, the pain is basically caused by the, the very fast deposit of energy really so you can do it slowly over a period of time yeah yeah. sort of goes against the uh, traditional principle though of selective uh, deposit of energy through um, you know the pulse duration being selected mm -hmm. correctly through the re relaxation time so so how's that is it less selective no it's still it's still selective but i mean we're we're pretty much always treating the, the melanin that we've got in the hair follicle is much more dense if you like than it is sort of when it's scattered dispersed within the skin so we can still treat and, and when we're treating darker skin types then we tend to be treating black hair don't we so we can still get the the temperatures that are required in the hair follicle without you know damaging the skin i assume you've got to protect the epidermis whilst doing that then yeah and most of them will well i guess all of them all the ones i've ever come across will have a chilled tip as yeah. well so you know it's a cold tip that cools down the surface of the skin whilst you're doing the treatment I can't imagine you could do it without that because essentially you're putting in lots of low level pulses and they're heating up the hair preferentially to it's, the skin yeah. but there's a lot of thermal diffusion going on in there there must be a lot of heat produced unlike the the very discreet pulse duration. if you've got dark skin i mean i've i've done it on my because i'm so pasty i've done it on myself without a cool tip being on <laughs> mm. and 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 it was fine it was you know it was fine but then i don't have very much melanin in my skin at all so this is where that little disclaimer should come on the screen do, oh yeah do don't do, do this at home <laughs> don't do this at home definitely uh what have we got next we've got yag lasers so yags yeah they're really versatile systems they are um you can frequency double them so you can get you can half the wavelength and get ktp uh they're the safest laser for darker skin types now you can treat fair skins with an ND YAG for hair removal, but you will need more treatments and it is a little bit more uncomfortable on the whole. But they are really the only lasers that you can use in standard modes that are suitable for treating um, the darkest skin types. You can also do a bit of rejuvenation. If you want to treat deeper vessels, so that's such as those on the legs, I mean, leg vessels are difficult for a whole host of reasons, but, but you, you need an ND YAG, an IPL or a pulse dye or a KTP is not going to cut it. Or for leg vessels because they're too deep um, so so you know a, a good option and certainly if you want to if you're in a, a big metropolitan area here in London Birmingham you know Manchester then and you want to treat a wide range of skin types I mean a yag is a really good option 
lots of companies, not, not just Linton, do, do a YAG and an Alex in one box because then you've got the most effective laser for the treatment of fairer skin types and then you've got the safest laser for the treatment of darker skin types as well. And for tattoo removal, if you wanted to buy one tattoo removal laser, then an ND YAG is always going to be your best option. Probably YAG, yeah. One, because you can treat black safer with this wavelength than you can with any other. Um, two, because you can frequency double it and then you can treat all your reds. So you can't treat your greens and your blues. So that, that's the, the, the problem with it. But you've got much faster repetition rates than you do with a Ruby or an Alex. I mean, this system here, this QS4, um, Q, um, ND YAG that we sell, goes at 20 hertz. I mean, that is so fast, that's 20 shots a second. I couldn't possibly use that, but you know, I think it'd just be overlapping too much. It's a really powerful, fast system that. You can imagine if you're treating a whole big back piece or something, you can get through it really quickly. Yeah. Then of course, we've got IPLs. So, you know, our sort of baby, <laughs> your baby yeah. especially, literally, yeah. John. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, yeah. Uh, IPLs, as I mentioned earlier, they're different to lasers in that it's not just one single wavelength of light. We've got the flash lamp that gives out a wide range of lamps, and then we use we, we use different filters to target either blood or to just target melanin, for example. So really nice, versatile systems. If you want one system and you want to do as much as you can, then a good IPL is, is definitely your best option. And for some treatments, for treatment of facial vessels, rosacea, you, I don't think there's anything that's better than, no. than a good IPL. I think, I think, I think that that's uh, been proven over the years so, so much so that I can remember when IPLs were first sort of launched, they were almost looked down upon slightly from the medical profession, just uh, uh, with a view that the words are good, as good as laser. Whereas now, I know most doctors, if, if you talk to them about using, um, you know, treating superficial red vein or superficial pigmentation, most of them want to reach for an IPL first. Yeah. As yeah. It's become and well, very, we've got dozens of these now in hospitals, yeah. haven't we? You know, yeah, so, and that certainly wouldn't accepted. have been the case 20 years ago or whenever. So someone's asking here, how does it compare to SHR? Is SHR the, what's SHR? Is it, uh, I think that's a diode. Okay. I, I think that's a diode system. I don't know too much about it actually. So I'll, I'll have to look. If you drop me an email, clinical at linton.co.uk, I'll have a look a bit more about it. Sales yeah, team might know a bit more because I guess somebody's helping us out here, saying they think it's um, they think it's a, a form of IPL. I suspect SHR is just another acronym for what is basically an intense pulse light of some sort. It's like like LHE. Do you remember those guys? I do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a brand. It's a brand name, but essentially it's an it's an IPL. I mean, the one thing I'd like to say about IPL, I've studied IPL for years, um, li literally, that's what my PhD was. And I, I do find um, IPL can come in for some criticism, and rightfully so, because there are many different, let's say, quality of IPL. And it's sort of, it's quite easy to put a, a light bulb in a box, is how I describe mm -hmm. it, and call it an IPL if you wanted to. It's incredibly difficult, actually, to, uh, pulse an IPL correctly, get the right wavelength out and the right energy and, and balance those three characteristics perfectly to get a, a very safe but effective treatment. And that's, what, that, that's what's really hard and what we spent years working on. And, uh, you know, if you do that right, the IPL is absolutely amazing. It's fantastic. If you don't do that well, then it really uh, it's, it's not a very good tool at all. And the trouble is then people just assume that one IPL is the same as another, but they're not. There are, there are some excellent IPLs yeah. and there are some light bulbs in boxes. And basically <laughs> you want to find the right, the right sort of IPL, essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lots of variation between, between IPL systems. And you do, like you say, you get people to say, oh, I had IPL and it, it didn't work. You know, well, that's because you had treatment with a bad IPL, I dare say. Um, Right, then, so we've, we've, we've basically covered all of the lasers that, that target um, haemoglobin and all of the lasers that target melanin. So now we're moving on to those lasers that target water. So the two most common ones that you've come across are the Erbium YAG. So anyone um, who's got a resurface handpiece has got an Erbium YAG laser, that's what, what that is. 
and that's right on the peak of the uh, uh, water absorption curve. So it's very, very well absorbed by water. And what that means is that it hits the skin and it all gets absorbed very rapidly and it doesn't go very deep. So it's very superficial, um, which is really useful for us with the resurface handpiece because it means that we can do these really lovely effective treatments, but without worrying about compromising the epidermal dermal boundary and, and, and therefore needing to be able to prescribe antibiotics and antivirals and things like that. Uh, so if you're doing more surgical procedures with the erbium YAG, some doctors really like it because you can do very, you get very fine control with it, but, um, and, and less downtime really than you would with, with a CO2 for example, but CO2 is much more commonly used for surgical procedures and that's because you get more heat deposited into the, um, the skin so you get much more downtime so you're talking about not leaving the house for seven days ideal for the if there was anyone still doing these treatments it's ideal for self-isolating um, but with those you tend to just if you're doing for example fully ablative resurfacing like a surgeon would do with an erbium yag you might need to do a few passes to get to where you want to but with a co2 it's just one and because of that heat as well, you can um, get hemostasis. So you can basically just coagulate, the, not coagulate, heat the blood and you get like a, a bloodless scalpel, basically. So you yeah, can use it as a knife for cutting things off and you don't get a load of bleeding as well. So we have CO2 down for surgery, ENT surgery, uh, we sell it for. And, um, you know, the advantage of that is you can, you know, do very, very precise and fine surgery on vocal cords but you also or, or cut out, um, you know, tumours from the throat, but, but, but it's used because it seals the blood vessels off at the same time. So you reduce the risks to the patient, you know, through bleeding essentially. So. Yeah. So both of these, these days are more commonly used as fractional lasers. So, yeah. so fractional, people think of ablative lasers when they're talking about fractional, but fractional just basically means that we're splitting the light up into tiny little beams. And delivering it to the skin so we can we can deliver any light fractionally it doesn't have to be a co2 or an erbium yag laser but there's not really much point in doing fractional hair removal for example you know so it's, it's usually used for for these sort of rejuvenation resurfacing procedures because you've got all of this healthy surrounding epidermis which means that it heals very quickly it heals much more quickly than it does with the traditional yeah, I get a lot of people just talking to me about fractional lasers and, and um, I think they sort of inter, inter switch the word ablative and fractional, thinking it's sort of one and yeah. the same thing or they're somehow inherently linked, but they're yeah. completely independent really. They just happen to be uh, fractional, it's just splitting the beam up into small, small micro beams. So, so ablative basically means that it's taking off the epidermis, it's taking yeah. off the top layer of the epidermis. That's what the traditional ablative lasers did. But the fractional ablative, what they do instead is they just drill tiny little holes into the skin. So you get very, you get much faster healing then. And that's what our resurface does, for example. But you can get non-fractional, sorry, non-ablative fractional treatments. Yeah. So the erbium glass, if anyone's heard of Thermage, that's um, non-ablative no. fractional Thermage was oh, the RF. Fraxel, sorry, Fraxel. Fraxel. Yeah, Thermage is the RF. Fraxel, they both came out about the same time. Yeah. The, the, the Fraxel is um, an erbium glass laser, so it's not drilling holes, it's just creating little zones of thermal damage, basically. So you can see that from the sort of histology there, it's just you know, causing little columns of heating, if you like. Yeah. So they tend to be, um, you can get some nice results with those. We've, we've had some non-ablative fractional lasers over the years, but you tend to need a course of treatments, um, yeah. you know, and, but less downtime than, than you would with a, a, a CO2, for example. So That's I great. think that brings us to the end. Fantastic, so, We have so got we, some questions yeah. popping up on the screen here that I, sort of uh let's backtrack a little bit and have a look at some yep. of these so so let's go with here, here's a good one um what's a different as one next slide what's the difference between erbium yag and erbium glass the, so the 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 laser itself or well i guess the, they're different so an erbium glass is a fiber laser actually i think 
Um, whereas an erbium YAG is a solid state laser. An erbium YAG is at 2940 nanometers. Erbium glass tend to be at uh, shorter wavelengths than that, so 1540. Yeah, they are two different it. types of laser. Mm, the, 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 the YAG is just, you'll have heard obviously there's ND YAG, neodymium YAG, erbium YAG, there's holmium YAG, there's a whole host of YAG lasers. And the YAG is just the, the sort of substrate that's then doped with these different elements that give the different wavelengths. I think erbium glass can be a crystal, but it's just a different substrate. It's just the erbium's um, in a different crystalline structure instead. Um, so the erbium is just the, the dopant, isn't it, really, I guess? Yeah, correct. Here's one. Um, you, you said your IPL is good for vascular, but what about the results for hair removal compared to laser? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so for hair removal, it's all about getting the pulse duration short. So our 650 uh, IPL, standard IPL hampies, we, I mean, we've had, it's been on the market, what, for 20 years now? Yeah. So we know that the results are, are, are really excellent with it. Compared to, I would say, compared to an Alexandrite laser, you probably would have to do maybe one or two more treatments with, with the IPL 650. But we do have the 650 Advanced handpiece. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with that one, which you can have on the Lumina. Wavelengths are exactly the same. The only difference is that we deliver the light much more quickly. And then that is more comparable to, to an Alex. And in fact, we, we've got one in um, uh, Glasgow Royal Infirmary and they were doing a study, uh, a side-by-side -side study of the Alexandrite and the 650 Advance. And the nurse I was speaking to there said that she preferred, she thought it was better for finer hair than an Alexandrite. So, you know, that, I think they're, they're comparable, I really do. Yeah. I've got, I've got one here then. Can you get a pico fractional laser? Yes. Yeah, you can. What would you, what would you use that for then? So that is used for rejuvenation, essentially. So with the idea that you're causing sort of damage a bit because it's using 1064. So you're, you're basically causing little zones of damage deeper within the skin and then just stimulating some collagenesis. I've got, um, what would be the best Q-switch for permanent makeup uh, tattoo removal? Yeah, well, ten, pro, at our clinic we have, you know, all of the wavelengths available to us and we use 1064 almost all of the time for that. I mean, I've got a, um, an example that I use in some of our courses, which is some semi-permanent makeup that went, was brown, then literally went yellow, orange, all sorts of ridiculous colours. And with that, in that paper, they were using um, 532 and 694 as well to remove those. But in, in my experience, just 1064 works really well, even if you do get a colour shift. So that's the one that I would go with. Fantastic. And I'm going to finish up now because we're, we've hit the hour mark. Um, just, a, just a comment from uh, Kerry. Kerry says the 650 advance is absolutely amazing, which is mm. fantastic to hear. Um, and we've had other, other people just thank you saying great, great seminar, Sam. So that's brilliant. There are a few other questions here. We'll try and get some answers back to you uh, just offline. We'll, we'll email some answers back to other questions. Yeah, we'll have a well, like I say, you. if anyone out there wants, has got any questions, if you email clinical at linton.co.uk, then, then that will come to me and I'll be able to, to get back to you. Fantastic. Sam, that's brilliant as always thank you very very much and thank you to everybody uh, who tuned in i think Haley's gonna we'll pop this up as a recording i did remember to record it so this will go uh, back on to the uh, i think the facebook group won't it the linkedin facebook group so if anyone has missed it or wants to go back over uh, that'll be something that uh, you can do in the linkedin facebook group okay fantastic thank you very much everybody hope thanks you enjoyed it thanks sam Take care. No See you soon. Take care. Bye. Cheers.